Hello everyone, and today is our third episode of CU Podcast. Live on four continents, visit 60 countries. Uh, but a big change for me was when I went to work for the state of New York. To manage this healthcare system, do you think you can like bring your idea equally to all different countries and to all different hospitals? Literally, show me a hospital, I can say, yeah, I've been there. Always issues around healthcare and money. If you don't have a brand, you have nothing to advertise. In our country, some procedures, especially for different type of cancers that are not available here. I'm good. I'm famous. I'm excellent. I don't need marketing. And today is our third episode of CU Podcast. And we're not getting that far from medical topics uh, as we had the last time, Leah. Uh, today we're about to speak about medicine again, but not in a prospect of, as a science, but uh, from the prospect of brand management, how to work in this field and how to make it more effective. And today we have our dear guests, uh, Miss... Uh, Paula Wilson and Mr. Ilan Geva. Uh, very nice to meet you here. Nice I you. hope you like Thank the you. Uzbekistan. And um, Leah, we're going to start? Yeah, let's start. We appreciate Thank you so much for coming today. It's a pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> I hope we will enjoy this talk. For sure. So uh, let's start from an easy thing. Can you please tell us about yourself briefly? Where do you work? How you came to this career? And... Just right. something to get a main idea. Do you first, do you want me first, or? Where is ready? Yeah, I can start. Well, okay. So um, I'm uh, today. I'm working as a consultant with V Marsh Healthcare Consulting, based out of Dubai. I've been there about a year and a half, and that, and your uh, the university actually is our client. This weekend, and we're working with you on a whole uh, conference that's been going on. But um, I've had a pretty extensive career uh, in the public and private sector. So in my uh, earliest years, I worked in the government in New York State, and I worked on the regulatory side of healthcare. I've always been in the health, education, and welfare arena. Mm -hmm. And so I worked um, at the county level, uh, at the social services department. Uh, but a big change for me was when I went to work for the state of New York, and I went to work for the administration of Mario Cuomo, who was governor at that point. You would have no reason to know who that is, but um, he was a very well-known governor at that time. And I worked on the policy, all the health care policy, and then I went on to become a deputy budget director. So I worked on all the financial aspects of financing health, education, and welfare. Um, and at one point, I was the uh, uh, chief operating officer, or executive deputy commissioner of the New York State Health Department. So I, I did a lot of, again, on it the was state, a, long journey, yeah. a lot of regulation, a lot of policy. It was a very interesting time to be in the government. Um, I was there as AIDS evolved, which was a very big issue in the 1980s and into the 1990s. Um, and and a, a lot of in interesting environmental health issues were uh, in the forefront in those days. And there's always issues around health care and money. So financing the hospitals, and, uh, setting the hospital rates, and making uh, health care accessible to all people, uh, no matter uh, whether or not they have insurance and whether or not they have uh, uh, money to pay for health care. And an interesting thing we worked on uh, during those years was also looking at the ethics of health care. So, uh, you know, uh, end-of-life care and uh, people's responsibilities and the health care responsibilities. I left government and went on to work in um, managed care for a while. I worked in um, a long-term care facility, a big nursing home in the Bronx in New York City, and uh, worked on different issues there. So, uh, And then uh, an unusual opportunity came to me. Um, I was doing a little teaching as an adjunct, and I had the opportunity to become a full-time associate professor in the practice at Columbia Uni University, a, a, a big school in the middle of New York. Columbia University is pretty well known, and I worked at the School of International and Public Affairs. And so I was Professor Wilson for seven years, um, um, teaching graduate students, and my courses there were all around financial management. So I had a course on financial management in government, and one in nonprofits, 
one in healthcare. It was a, a very interesting time. And I, I did quite a bit of teaching. I left there and then went on to work at NYU. Um, I had my own consulting practice during those days as well and worked with clients in New York, uh, all different types. And then I had a really uh, interesting opportunity come my way where I became the chief executive officer of Joint Commission Resources, Joint Commission International. And that's a uh, subsidiary of the Joint Commission, which is a very well-known health regulatory organization in the United States. And I had the privilege of leading um, uh, there uh, many things. We were a software company, we were a publisher, but we did all of the accreditation outside the United States. So I had a enormous, uh, a lot of, I'll say it was a lot of fun, very interesting. I learned a lot, but uh, visiting hospitals all over the world, in South America, in Asia, in Middle East, uh, Europe, everywhere, um, I had the opportunity to meet with people and talk about safety and quality uh, and speak on those issues and attend conferences and um, a really great experience. Um, and then, at, you know, some, my experience is even that type of a job at some point after 11 years, it was time to move on. So I moved back to New York and I have my own consulting company there, but then I work with other consulting companies and uh, not all the, all the time. I try to keep some time to enjoy New York and enjoy traveling. I'm gonna, in fact, stay here for another week. Uh, really? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm gonna see your country. I've never been to Uzbekistan and I've read about it and I'm very excited to, on uh, Monday I'll go to Samarkand. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you can go to Bukhara. I'm going to do that as well. Though I have time for the two. I'm I, too it's doing it for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm a really lucky person. You know, sometimes people, there's a saying, is it better to be smart or lucky? I think it's better to be lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like very lucky that. Uh, it's even better if you have a combination of two. And, and opportunities, right? So, uh, so you know, it's it's been interesting, and I I know you know as a result of that I. I know a lot about a lot of things, you know, uh, different parts, especially in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much. How about you, Mr. Gila? Call me Elon. So I have also, you know, like Paula, er anybody who owns a little bit of gray hair had few careers. <laughs> right. Not just one. I guess it's waiting us too, right? So yeah, you yeah. <laughs> you're waiting for your first career. We are, we had them. So among the careers that I had, and I was again very very fortunate to live on four continents, visit sixty countries, uh, and work with clients all over the world. And when I say work with clients, my first career was in advertising, and I worked for global advertising agencies as creative director. And I was in charge of some pretty famous accounts, you know, among them American Express and oh. Shell. And, you know, some of them were also pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were tourism accounts. Mm -hmm. So I got to know a few countries and promote countries as destinations. Um, I was based, uh, I started, I was born in Israel and then... In the 1980, I moved to Johannesburg in South Africa, and I became the design head of Ogilvy & Mather, which basically was the design head in Africa, because we had clients all over the continent. We also collaborated with other offices of Ogilvy, which is a big, big international ad agency. And uh, after five years there, I found myself getting another job with the same network in Los Angeles. So suddenly, the whole American market opened to me with a completely different set of clients, new opportunities. Uh, and after a while, I got one of those offers you cannot refuse to move to Chicago with Leo Burnett, which was also a huge advertising agency. Um, and I stayed in Chicago since then. But during the jobs that I had in Chicago, and I also opened my own ad agency. Mm -hmm. At some point in my career, I started to trust advertising less than other things. And the other things are the development of brands, because I look at brands as 
If you don't have a brand, you have nothing to advertise. That's the simple truth. And it really doesn't matter in what field your brand is. It could be healthcare, it could be tourism, it could be banking, it could be, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what, a university. You have to market it, but you need a brand to market. So I had my own consultancy for many, many years. And during that time, I had a great opportunity because I realized that during my career, I had healthcare accounts and I had tourism accounts. If you put these two together, you get medical tourism. Yeah. So medical tourism became a, a phenomenon about 20 years ago. But in truth, medical tourism always existed because the principle of people traveling to get treatment in another place always existed. It just started to get some kind of backwind from different directions. You know, suddenly people saw an opportunity to make money and governments saw it an opportunity to promote their country, uh, to make it another source of income, you know, just like an export yeah. of sorts. So 15 years ago, I became really active in the field. And I became active because people invited me to speak mm -hmm. in conferences about how to brand the destination as a destination for medical tourists. And I had great opportunities. And as I mentioned before, I visited many countries, hundreds of hospitals. I cannot even remember the names and the places, but literally show me a hospital i can say yeah i've been there um and i developed other observations mm -hmm. and sensitivities to the whole business of the medical field and healthcare because i'm very lucky i am now the head of academics at vmarsh and i have the wonderful peer <laughs> this that gives me a chance to be exposed and then become friends with wonderful people like Paula and others who are here today. Uh, and we have a wonderful team. The, the one thing that really typifies our team is that we are all very experienced people. So we bring to the table a lot of knowledge with experience. Um, and yet, we always learn. So, for example, Uzbekistan. I mean, I've, I've been here, what? not even 48 hours, I learned a lot about your university, about you as people, and opportunities that exists for us to continue and collaborate in the future, hopefully. So VMarsh has started discussions with your university about a month and a half ago, and we went through a few phases of formatting the whole concept of what are we going to talk about? What are we going to say? And here we are. We are four people that are speaking in turns for two days um, on very different topics because the expertise of Paula and her experiences are very different from mine. So since you mentioned brand management, it is something that I already spoke about. Uh -huh. I gave what? Three, I think, mm -hmm. three. three presentations, all of them touch mm -hmm. upon the topic of brand management. And there is one observation that I can make, which is in my career, and this is, by the way, something that I learned not only from books, but from my personal experience. Um, many doctors, as well as other professions, have a tendency to think that I'm good. I'm famous. I'm excellent. I don't need marketing. People will come to me. No. It doesn't work anymore. It may have worked 40, 50 years ago. It doesn't work now. The simple reason is that there is huge competition. If you just, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many countries are in the world. What, 210, let's say. There is anything from 120 to 150 countries that claim to be hubs of medical tourism. That's ridiculous. Okay? So that's where the need to understand marketing, understand 
business, because we're talking about business, the need to understand that combined with excellence in providing healthcare services is really, that's the formula. But there is a tendency, specifically what I've seen, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I've seen doctors who become CEOs of hospital think that they can also manage the marketing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I had the, the fortune to sit with some of them and actually convince them that they're wrong. My very simple analogy was this. My friend, respected doctor, professor, you're a surgeon. You're a brilliant surgeon. You're not a brilliant marketer. I am the brilliant marketer, and I'm not going to do surgeries because I don't know what you know, but you don't know what I know. That's simple. Start from there. That's a formula of synergy. Like Even though you're in kind of like different angles of the medical field, but your main goal is to make the medical care accessible and uh, heard by people, I mean by community. Because... Um, as you said about medical tourism, uh, for example, uh, in our country, some procedures, especially for different type of cancers that are not available here, and what people can do, they can go to the web, search for the hospital, let's say in Turkey, this is the help of medical tourism. And uh, as you spoke about GCI standards as well. Uh, we also have uh, Akfa Midline Hospital here. They have this GCI accreditation, and I know some like background information, for example, as I know, these rules were built uh, on a different stories of people because it covers everything, starting up from like simple injections, how you need to do those injections and ending up by how you need to store the medicine. Very important. Yeah. And um, it's really good that uh, they are implementing it here in Uzbekistan because uh, comparing to all the other hospitals, I personally I had an experience in different hospitals. Like and Garmental and uh, like the they are the GCI is not only a standard just for accreditation. It gives the system right. starting off from the doctor and ending for patient safety and doctor safety as well. Okay. They have yeah different codes. They have um, like even the appointment, the interview. Most of the patients are left unheard. And here at our university, we're practicing. Um, clinical skills, how to communicate with the patient. Because the problem here was the patients is they don't have enough time to speak because uh, the system of like, let's say primary healthcare, it's overload, super yes. overload. The patients are left unheard and at the end of the day, they're coming with the latest stage of cancer because the screening was not performed. And I'm really happy that we have those type of people like, as you um, that are helping like the people to the community um, to kind of like solve these problems. Yes. And uh, even though you're not like medical professionals, but you know how to help like the doctors, the surgeons. And um, I would like to ask a question about how the system change with your impact. Do you have any kind of like let's say this, um, how you can call it, like my did stuff, for example, I did this and I'm really satisfied with this thing, was in my whole career that stuck in your mind and you're really happy that you did it. Okay. I hope you got the question. I think that if there's one thing, okay, so I wasn't sure where you were going. I think that the one thing I did consistently in my career was to take a risk. And that's hard for people to do. Um, you know, I left jobs that people might not have left. Um, I had to, one job I had to leave because we lost an election. So when uh, the governor who I worked for, he got, he lost. So we were done. We knew, I knew the date that I had to leave. That was one of the best things that happened to me because it forced me to reevaluate. Okay, I'm not going to live in this city anymore. I'm going to do something new. I'm lucky I live in a state with, you know, New York City is a huge yeah. enterprise. And um, it was not that hard to find another job. Uh, some of those early jobs didn't work out. And 
you don't panic, you find a next job, you know? And I think one of the things I've observed is that um, in, a lot of people are risk averse and they uh, stay in a position that they're really not happy, but they're afraid to change. And I always want, especially when I'm talking to students and younger people, um, you can't always do that. Sometimes your life is such that you can't afford to make a change, but most people should uh, take, take a, a risk. risk. Yeah. Take a risk. The other thing is to think outside of what you're currently doing. You know, you may be, you have an expertise, you're getting wonderful education, you're, but things change, you know, opportunities come, and especially in the current circumstances of the world with technology changing healthcare. Yeah. You know, what you're doing today, and what you, your, your first job out of the university will be really different than the one you have after 10 years. But you have to be, people resist change, and I think that sometimes it's a detriment to their careers because they're afraid to, to make a change. And uh, I have found that change is really, really good. And I think that's why I've got, I've got a pretty good resume. I have a lot of experience. Uh, and you have to be curious too a little bit. You have to you know, yeah. wanna learn. You, you know, I always, when I talk to my students when I was teaching, I had um, three things. One was to, be, to, to take a risk, to, to look outside your comfort zone. Um, another was to learn a second language. I always said that. And uh, what was the third one? I have to think for a minute. There were three. Travel? Travel? And travel might have been part of that. <laughs> yeah. but, um, to, to, uh, to, but that maintaining that curiosity, you know, and, and yeah. because people get into tracks, you know, you're going to have a long career, and I'll stop talking in a minute, but your, your lifespan expectancy is very long. You're going to work a long time because of that. I predict that I won't be there then. And you're training to be a physician, correct? Yeah. At the end of that, you may not be a physician anymore. You know, you, you'll still use those skills in some way, uh, or maybe not, but uh, you have a long span there, and people will be doing different things. Oh, I know what the other one was. Make sure you have a second language, you know. Um, I always advised that those, in those years, I would advise my students to learn uh, Mandarin, because the United States, at that point, we were doing a lot of work with China, and there's uh, 1.4 really billion people speak Chinese, yeah. and I still think that, you know, no matter what it is, you'd have a, se a second language is yeah. really important. So kind of meandering a little bit there, but, you know, don't narrow your thinking. Yeah. Um, so many people, they, okay, this is what I do, and that... Yeah, they just think, like, this is what I'm doing, I should do this, and then... And they stay so, at that. Now, yeah. now, some people, They're just and scared. I, I see this with artists, people who have a specific kind of, they, they're a, a, an amazingly creative person, writing, painting, but, you know, I, maybe that's different. I don't have any of those skills, even though I'd love to, uh, and maybe that's not the same, but for most of us, we work, you know. Um, we, I guess that it has, like, some kind of psychological impact as well. Maybe, maybe, because yeah, Because you never know yet what kind of background that person has yes. and why exactly he's scared to move forward. I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, some of his personality, but I think, you know, there was an old adage, as soon as you get a new job, I used to tell a lot of my friends and everybody, as soon as you get a new job, the first thing you do is update your resume uh -huh. because you never know what's going to happen the next day. I am eternally optimistic. So, uh, you know, I, my resume is up to date and at this point in my career, it's probably not so important, but you know, even you're happy, something else comes along, you're ready to go and talk and see and, and be curious about it. So one point that I want to touch about something that we talked about before, uh, we may not be doctors, but we are patients. Yeah. So never forget that. That's important. Yeah. We look at your profession from the other side. And because we do what we do, we judge the doctors in a very different way. Not in a biased way like we might do. In a professional way. Yeah. Right. And, and sometimes I have my doctor who is a young physician. She must be 35 at the most. It's a lovely lady. We have conversations. She wants to hear from me. Good. And, and that's something that she cannot hear from other patients who have no touch and no involvement at all with this kind of profession and don't travel as much as I do and don't have the exposure to hospitals and doctors and, you know. So that's an important thing to remember. Now, I want to touch for a minute on 
the JCI conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say it in a presentation that is upcoming. Okay. And I may piss her off. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> My view on JCI, and I'm talking within the context of branding. Mm -hmm. Hospital that goes through the JCI testing and, you know, preparation and finally approval, they tend to use it as like a jewel in the crown. But having JCI is not marketing, is not branding. It's true. You have to use it right to know what you're doing because JCI is a process. And it's a, of course, you need that process, yeah. but it only helps to build your reputation. But you have to be careful. Don't think that if you will put on your business card the JCI logo and give it to another doctor, that that builds your brand. Not at all. And I always recommend, there was a, a guy, I'm, I'm sorry I forgot his name, but he was the chief marketing officer of Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. for 25 years. And when he came to Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic, the big brand, you know, they looked at him like, we don't need marketing. We are Mayo Clinic. It's true. The Mayo Clinic was a brand already, but they thought that, okay, now that we are a brand, we don't have to do marketing. And he came in and he had to fight department after department after department to understand that they need, because, because you have to stay relevant. Okay, and if you don't do that, the brand may live, but then you have to think that but there was a Cleveland Clinic, and there was a Johns Hopkins, and there was this, and there was that, and everybody's competing with everybody. So there is a paradox in the U.S. It's considered to be the most expensive place in the world for healthcare. It absolutely is. <laughs> However, the U.S. makes most money from medical tourism more than all other countries. Why? Good branding. I have a theory. Go ahead, no, you answer. So uh, the simple truth is that when people go to Turkey, since you mentioned Turkey, yeah. and what do they go for? Yeah. Hair, hair transplant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some dental. <laughs> so, IVF sometimes. But if they have major problem, where do they go? Mayo Clinic and Cleveland and Johns Hopkins. And... Um, Remind me of the name of the uh, cancer center in New York? Sloan Kettering. Sloan Kettering. That's where they go. Or to Houston, right. Andy Anderson. Right. You know, the big centers of excellence. And those people know each and every touch point of patients with the organization. And there's one thing I would add to that. And uh, I'm, there are many things that are amazing about the healthcare system in the United States, but there are a lot of problems. We have serious problems as well. But there's one thing that I think does distinguish the, the U.S., and I'm not here to brag about the United States, but no one spends as much money as we do on biomedical research. Yes. So Absolutely. Um, a lot of these patients, you would never go to the United States unless something was serious and unique. It's because, but people come there because there are times when there's only one or two doctors in the world that knows about a specific condition. And so people come there, if they're able to, you know, it's very hard, it's expensive and all that. But that, the, the investments that we do in biomedical research means that often there's only some one person that knows about this condition and they're in the US and that's why people come there. So if you look at cost per person, when you go to Turkey for hair transplant, what are you gonna spend? A thousand bucks? Well, definitely okay. much cheaper than US. Well, no, but you go to Mayo, you're spending 250000 Right. So Mayo Clinic needs only 1,000 medical tourists a year. And for that amount of money, Turkey needs 1 million people. And Turkey does a lot of work other than hair. Correct. I mean, yeah. you know, but they, since we mentioned, I'm just... They, you know, there's some really great hospitals there that do organ transplants totally. and all kinds of things. So I, I had a chance uh, to have an internship like this summer oh, good. and Medipal Clinic. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. They do IVF. Oh. Uh, they do different stuff, but I personally was working in IVF department. Good. And they were saying that a lot of people are coming from different Asian countries. And um, 
I mean, people are going for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We travel for IVF. Yeah. Um, and there were a lot of JCI hospitals that I visited that had pretty robust IVF programs. So, and, and there are many reasons, which could include political, religious. Yeah. You right. know, there are many. IVF is a, is a topic that could be extremely sensitive, yeah. even in the U.S. Key point. 50 states. We're arguing about it We right are now. exporting now, you know, the whole yeah. business of OBGYNs in certain states that are afraid to even practice. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a very touchy yeah. issue. Here as well. Because not, uh, for me, I want to become a reproductologist. And it's really hard to practice it here because we don't have specific doctors that practice it here. I they see. might be endocrinologists, oh. but they're not reproductologists because all this hormonal stuff is related, but they do have a different certificates from different fields. I see. And they, they're saying that we are reproductologists. But uh, it became a tendency now to go for this type of doctors because uh, like uh, you're getting married, uh, you want to have a child, even though you don't have kind of like opportunity physiologically to right. have a child, you do have a right to have it. Why Absolutely. not? Yeah. Absolutely. I, well, and, I totally uh, agree. <laughs> yeah. But and uh, I wanted to say that like, uh, even though people are still, we do have different type of people. Not every time like would have 100% of popul population that would say, okay, it's good or it's not a good. But our job is to convince them, to mm -hmm. give them uh, like the whole information and Absolutely. try to raise the awareness about mm -hmm. these topics. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I guess it's really important if this all like branding system would be uh, put in educational system as well. Yeah. And presented to students from like young age and not only medical students, but in general to whole students. Because I'm sure that every person, no matter of their field, will need this uh, knowledge in their future. Like I said, with their protocologists, they want to have a baby. Like if they know that there's some specific people who can help you, I'm sure that they will go there. That's but if they don't have an idea about this, they will never like think about it out of nowhere. Like, oh, I need to go there. So you're saying some people don't aren't aware that you can even exactly. have this kind of Exactly. I think the procedure. level of education, yeah. the level of education in each country, since you traveled a lot, I'm sure you know that education really plays a role. Yeah. And in some countries, yes. there's a very low education. Yep. Yes. And in some countries, students get like a, a lot amount of knowledge, and so they're aware of all the things. So I think this thing should be like promoted. To Still, students. it's about socioeconomic status as well, because yeah, it's this. expensive. Yeah. Not everyone can afford it. I guess well, it depends and, and again, I guess it depends on the country. Certainly, the yeah. countries where I work with JCI, um, it was a very common that hospitals knew about it. I visited quite a few IVF clinics over the years, and it would be you know part of what we did as part of the accreditation as well. But uh, yeah, there are places that you're making a good point where it's not prominent. And, and what I hear you saying is the citizens don't even know that this is available yeah. to them. Yeah, because well, the like world is not one group of clients. The world is very yeah, diversified, right. and it's you know it's 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 an amazing thing to see how people think in one place because we tend to speak in very very big terms. So we talk about AI and we talk about the internet. Don't forget that you know the population of this globe, a third don't have access to the yes. internet. But what do you do about those people? So we, we keep bragging about, oh, we provide this and this and this, and it's all on this. Well, millions of people don't have this. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Because even in Tashkent, maybe everyone has a phone, but if you go outside, I'm from a small city here mm -hmm. called Jizak. It's It goes Tashkent, Jizak, then Samarkand. You will probably, if you go by okay. train, you- I'm taking uh, that train, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, People there, they don't have phones. Wow. They, if they want to go a uh, physician, they don't, they don't have a chance to even like type or see what kind of like doctor do I need to go. And uh, here, what we're doing at university, we have our kind of like an idea startup project. Uh, we created a AI anonymous. Basically, if you're a patient, you can uh, give a symptom. For example, like I have a headache. And uh, I feeling like I want to vomit. As a patient, you enter here, 
And uh, it gives you, starting up from 10 to 15 questions. Interesting. Yeah, and um, it gives you a suggestion. So go to a neurologist or go to a therapist, mm -hmm. and then, then, then it can be developed. But it's just a small startup. Mm -hmm. And after that, we started to think that, okay, we'll implement this project. Um, people are using their phones here, here. But how about all the other ones? Right. And we came to idea that we can make a project outside of the Tashkent. Um, we don't have the names now. It's just undergoing. It's like the idea. discussion, yeah, idea I stuff. Understand. And uh, we are planning to take a car, take a students, and go outside and make face-to-face -face discussion. That's very, very important. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Very important. Just to <laughs> implement. Because uh, we're studying different like courses, we know like to raise the awareness. You have newspapers, phones. We know that uh, we have a targeting community. For example, like people who are more than 40, 50, they don't tend to sit on their phones. They read newspapers. If we want to target target some diseases, we go to newspapers. That's it. If we want to target, let's say, a pregnant mom, we go to uh, like different phones because sure. they tend to see. Like right. a lot of stuff in their phone and search, and um, you as a like professional in this field, do you have any other like suggestions how to raise? If I want to raise the awareness about some topics, like specific topics, from the brand prospect, from your like professional standard designing prospect, let's say, what would you suggest? So not only give from me an example of like what you're thinking about. For example, mm, let's say. Me as a student, I have a project and I want to raise the awareness about, um, let's say, breast cancer. Okay. What should I start with? Well, my experience, and in fact, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of breast cancer campaigns. Uh, we, when I was with the New York State Health Department, we used to do that. And uh, New York is a big state, it's very diverse. So the way you approach a community, you need to have a very good awareness of who lives there and what the norms are mm. and what the culture is like. And, um, and, and we're, you know, we had people from all over the world live in a state like New York. And the way that, or uh, the way cancer is approached, or the way breast cancer specifically, is not the same. So women in the African-American community versus women in the Latino community versus women in other, you know, all, all those yeah. segments. And so what we would do, and we would work, we had a whole department that worked on this on breast cancer and on uh, outreach. So you have to find the stakeholders. You have to find who, who are the leaders in this community mm -hmm. and connect with them and begin to talk to them. Because if the health department goes into any community of any ethnic racial background without some kind of, we don't have any credibility. In fact, yeah. a lot of people are afraid. We're from the government. We're, you know, we're from a regulatory uh, organization. You need to find local partners who will work with you to bring the message yeah. to the community. Um, it's very interesting, it's really interesting work, satisfying work, but um, I think what happens sometimes with a regulatory organizations, it, uh, they don't mean to, but they have an arrogance. They think they're way smarter than they are. Mm -hmm. And on certain things, they're definitely smart and they are the experts. But how to bring a message about IVF or about breast cancer or about other health issues to men and women in different communities yeah. with different socioeconomic, different ethnic backgrounds, you need to be um, comfortable with your ignorance mm -hmm. and knowledgeable about how little you might know about what it means to talk to these communities. Yeah. So you basically do. what you're saying, do homework. Do the do homework. Do research. Yeah. But don't, don't move without it. Yeah. But be humble in your ignorance also. Because you when you're a top expert on something, you're, 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 you're one of the best breast cancer doctors, you know, but you don't know exactly how to approach that community. So I, that was one of the messages of yesterday is the humility in a good leader. You're super smart. You've got the credentials, all of that. Don't lose the humility. And, and I've seen a lot of physicians that are tremendously talented, but they don't, they're not humble. And there are things they don't know. And especially when you're doing things in the public health arena. That education of doctors is basically to solve problems. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. But they're not mechanics. They, they, they don't solve problems in a car yeah. that doesn't work. They solve problems of a human being. They have life in their hands. So some of them tend to think that they're above humans. They're a little bit of gods. Yeah. Okay. They have degree. <laughs> Arrogance, the whole thing. Okay. And that immediately disqualifies them in certain areas from being su- successful. Because number one, you were talking about curiosity. They stop being curious. They think they know everything. So you have to be careful. And that's, of course, you cannot generalize and say all of them are. No, not at all. But some of them are. And if they happen to be in a key position, they can kill a product. Yeah. yeah. I guess they get this power, you yes. know. Yeah. They get Absolutely. this management in their hands and they're like, oh, I can manage you, I can manage this, and I can do surgeries and I can treat people. I am everything. That's what we talked about yes. yesterday, about yes. leadership. Yes. Yeah. I had these problems are always faced in surgeons because they usually tend to do kind of like hand work. They don't talk with their patients. And here as well, patients are saying, if you go to a therapist, they talk very kind, they're very lovely. Right. But if you go to a surgeon, they're very hard. They're like, Okay, you have a bellyache, appendicitis. Okay, let's go. Yeah. They don't describe anything and they just do. That's the it's big true. Thing. I've, but yeah, and you can't say that's true for everybody. But and the surgeons were are are, def, are are really good and they're really smart, and that is both an asset and a detriment. So we were, we were you know, when we were talking about there's a practice in safe care that um, if you're conducting a surgery, you mark whatever it is you're going to do. Yeah. So if you're going to remove and there's a timeout before the surgery yeah. starts. All of that's become pretty commonplace now. But when that was first introduced, the concepts of surgical site marking and timeout, there's, there took a long time for, to get all of the doctors on board to understand the value of those kinds of techniques and how you can avoid really serious errors, like removing the wrong body part, yes. um, doing the wrong kidney removal. Yeah. And all, they're catastrophic. They don't happen often. But they are catastrophic when they happen. Uh, and you have to keep working on that. You have to keep working on that. Uh, the, you know, one, one that I, I, I remember we talked a lot about, I think there's still a lot of noise around it, is standardizing the surgical tools. So that you, know, you have five, six surgeons, whatever it is in the hospital, everybody uses the same set of tools, they're cleaning the same. There's a lot of resistance to those kinds of yeah. things because one person likes these and these. But I understand that, but from a patient perspective, it's better to have those things standardized. It's more safe. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I would like to go back a few topics back, actually. Sure. Uh, you said that, again, about traveling. And since this whole, like, healthcare system is trying to be one thing, right? And you go to different countries. I'm sure, like, you can manage it all at this, in the same perspective mm-hmm. and in the same way. So when you visited all these hospitals and you talk to different doctors... Do you think that their brand managing and all this system is actually can be like can be brought into one field? Say it again. Yes, I didn't. I didn't understand. I didn't catch it either. I mean, like when you go to different hospitals yeah. and you talk to different uh, surgeons, you know they think differently. They have their own opinion, and when you're trying to teach them one thing, it's how like to manage this healthcare system. Do you think you can like bring your idea equally to all different countries and to all different hospitals? The mm-hmm. level of expe- uh, like the level how they can uh, get the information that you're giving. Example, like you're coming here in Uzbekistan, you're introducing the same concept that you introduced in US. Right. That's mm-hmm. the level different of understanding the concept. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. I think it's about the background that doctors are having because um, here in Uzbekistan, it became recently very popular to have a own branding as a doctor. They post different like Instagram stories. They announce different like, uh, for example, come to me, I'll do like two uh, lab tests for free and then I'll make a checkup and all this stuff. And in US they experienced in like for years, maybe like 10 or five, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, I'll ask a different. very simple question. Okay. Do you think that if Coca-Cola <laughs> is making a brown drink with bubbles inside, and you will do it now in Uzbekistan, you think it's going to work? No. Oh, yeah. No. 
It's the same thing. The rules apply, you know, there is no one size fits all. Yeah. Doesn't work. So I will go back to the, who are you? Why are you doing this? What are you trying to achieve? Okay. The basic questions. And, you know, many people I see because I worked with students who had in business schools who developed, you know, in incubators and they came mm -hmm. up with ideas and the whole idea. And there was this mindset of young students who wrote a business plan for whatever idea, it doesn't yeah. matter what. Their mindset was to get money, seed money. We open the business, we work for year one, and they have the projections, the financials. Oh, you know, they, they worked really on that. that. Yeah. And they have five pa 500 pages on that. Yeah. Year three, the, the year four. Year five IPO, we become millionaires and we retire. Right. right. Yeah. How many of those reality. succeed? Yeah. And I compare it to very different stories, but similar. We have in the U.S. college sports, oh, we football, need. big time, basketball, big time. How many of them make it to the NBA? One percent. And they're all brilliant players. One percent makes it to the NBA. Yeah. Same thing in business. So... If you said that, you know, some doctors think that, oh, the other one did social media. I'm going to do social media. For me, as a marketer, as a creative thinker, I would say I will do exactly the opposite. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's why why would uniqueness. I be like him? Yeah. I want to be different. Something unique. Yes. Exactly. So if you approach things from that angle, then you are curious. You are courageous, mm -hmm. and you might have better chances. You're taking a little risk. Yeah. And you love traveling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if you would have a chance to spoke for like billions of people by looking to the camera, what would you like to say or like to suggest. speak up? Yeah. To suggest. Yeah. For students, not only medical, general. Young Workers, people. students, whatever it is, just. Like, what's my message to the yeah, yeah. to the yeah. audience, yeah. to young people? Yeah. Well, I kind of said, and I truly believe that um, that you have to be curious. You have to. One of my true beliefs is that you need it's, it. Part of it is the curios curiosity, which is related to you have to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, yeah. You really do. What it's kind of what I said at the beginning: a lifelong learner, curious, um, and. Take a risk on yourself. You're smart. You're educated. Uh, those are the people that tend to go farther in the career, their careers. Uh, so that's really uh, my my real message is that, and, you, and whatever you know today isn't enough. You do have to keep learning, and you don't have to keep going back to universities. I mean, you, but there's all different ways now. It's you know I I use Duolingo every day now for a, over a thousand days. Do I speak Spanish? No, not really speak Spanish. But at least you try. Can I read Spanish? Pretty well. You know, and I certainly can help people in getting directions in the streets of New York City if they come from parts of the world that speak Spain. Spanish. I don't need to learn Spanish for anything, but I like the engagement. I want to know something new and different. So that my message is lifelong learning, curiosity, learn another language, and be kind is the other one. Because uh, certainly in my country today, kindness is in um, desperate need. Yeah, rare commodity. Uh, we are very, very divided right now, and I worry about that. And I understand why it happens, but we're all good people, and people who don't agree with me are still good people, and we have to find that kindness as a, as a country. So I think that's an important message. I agree with everything Paul said. <laughs> I would just say, um, think of yourself as the luckiest person in the world because you are young and everything is open for you because 50 years from now, not everything will be open for you. That's true. Okay. And, and you will be looking back more than look forward. You at this point in your life, 
you have everything to look forward to, so stop bitching. <laughs> okay? No, and you're, and, you're, and you're privileged. You're able to go. You're getting an amazing ed education. And yep. You have lots and lots of things to look forward to. That's a good message. I tell my students not to worry about grades. I see students, you know, at the end of a semester, a student comes to me, a student that got A minus. Why? Because there is a point system and yeah. they were just five points under. So it became A minus. That student was crying yes. her I've eyes I've out. I've the same. A minus and they're upset. Upset? I mean, they were like committing suicide almost. <laughs> We do have same students here. Our yeah, it's all over the world. Yeah. And I'm asking them, wait a minute. Look, you are my student for a whole semester. I respect you. I love you. I gave you everything. Just take it and run. Right. You didn't lose anything in my eyes, in my view. And then, so value yourself for what you are. Very important. That's it. I guess we're done. It was very lovely to talk. It was great you. speaking you. with you. Thank you. Yeah. Very pleasant. We learned experience. a lot of things from your field, and I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Well, I hope that I, hope you I will have a chance Uzbekistan. to come back because Paula is now doing all this touring here, and I'm so well, jealous. I, I wasn't going to come this far and not see this beautiful and interesting country. And I, um, there's a writer named Malouf who wrote a book, Samarkan, in the 1800s. To fit, and and uh, I read it a while ago. I have to go back to it. But that's that made me curious about the Silk Road. There were I, re I read a couple things, and then there was a series on TV, the public television, on the on the you know on the Silk Road, mm -hmm. and it went to all of the mm -hmm. key points. Yeah. And that's what I was like. I want to see that. Yeah. And then this opportunity came, and I you all enjoyed it. So I was I was very excited about seeing you and meeting you and doing the event, but uh, also seeing your country. It's really. Did you mention the Hampton Hotel? Uh, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. It's in the center of the city, right? It's a great yeah, hotel. Yeah. I like it a yeah. lot. We, we, we enjoy many different little things here, but food. I mean, We're very people, lucky. We're having a really great. wonderful time in your country. Great. Uh, I think we're putting like five pounds on, but. <laughs> yes. But Have it's a all lovely good. train trip. Thank you. I'm excited. Thank you, guys, and good luck. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for coming.